seven. So I think we will begin. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Avi Chomsky, and I'm going to be moderating tonight's event. Um, the title of our webinar tonight is Myths, Realities, and Implications of China's Nuclear Buildup. And it is sponsored by the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy, the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, and Massachusetts Peace Action. Um, we have a very um, eminent panel of speakers here tonight. Um, before I introduce them, I just wanted to um, mention, many of you have figured this out already, that the chat is open. If anybody would like to communicate with each other or introduce yourselves, the chat is open for that. Um, after the presentations, we are going to have some time for Q&A discussion. If you have questions as we're going along, feel free to post them in the Q&A function. Um, that's where we'll, we will be taking questions from. So don't put your questions in the chat. That's just for you guys to communicate with each other. Um, if you want us to see your questions, put them in the Q&A, please. Um, so our speakers tonight are Hans Christensen, the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. He writes about nuclear weapons policy there. He is co-author of nucle the Nuclear Notebook column for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and the World Nuclear Forces Appendix in Stockholm, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's annual CIPRI yearbook. His work especially relies on using the Freedom of Information Act to compel US government agencies to release documents. He maintains an online overview of the number of nuclear weapons in the world and writes frequently on the Federation of American Scientists strategic security blog. We also have Tong Zhao, a senior fellow in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace as well as a visiting research scholar at Princeton University's Science and Global Security Program. His research focuses on strategic security issues such as nuclear weapons policy, deterrence, arms control, non-proliferation, missile defense, hypersonic weapons, and China's security and foreign policy. He serves on the board of directors of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, and on the advisory board of the Missile Dialogue Initiative. Zhao is also an associate editor of Science and Global Security and is a member of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. And finally, Michael Clare, who is co-chair of the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy. He is a five colleges emeritus professor of peace and world security studies and defense correspondent of The Nation magazine. He serves on the board of directors of the Arms Control Association, is a regular contributor to many publications, including The Nation, Tom Dispatch, and Mother Jones, and is a frequent columnist for Foreign Policy in Focus. His books include All Hail Breaking Loose, The Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change, Resource, Resource Wars, and Blood and Oil, The Dangers of, and Consequences of America's Growing Petroleum Dependency, as well as others. So the format for tonight, um, we're going to begin with a short uh, background introduction by Michael Clare, and then I will be posing two questions to the panelists, and each one will have a chance to give their response to those two questions. And after that, we will um, be taking questions from the audience as you post them in the Q&A. So without, and we will wrap up at around 8.30. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Michael Clare to um, give us the background of what we're going to be talking about. And then I will pose my two questions. Thank you, Avi, and uh, welcome everybody. And thank you to my co-panelists this evening for this very important webinar. Uh, this is a very important topic, myths, realities and implications of the Chinese nuclear buildup uh, for, for many reasons. It's an important topic because military hawks in Congress are using 
inflated and misrepresented claims of China's nuclear activities, both to increase funding on US nuclear weapons and to portray China as an especially threatening enemy of the United States and thereby justify a whole range of military activities, both nuclear and conventional. So it, it's acquired enormous significance uh, as a topic in Washington. And therefore, it's very important that we obtain fact-based, unbiased information and analyses of China's nuclear activities. And that's so easy a thing to do. And you're very lucky to have these, uh, my, my co-panelists tonight, because they're both experts on the topic. And the topic has received growing urgency in recent years for a number of reasons. And I'd like to mention them very briefly before we get started, just to set the context for our discussion. Uh, first, historically, China has maintained a very small nuclear arsenal compared to the US and Russia. Both US and Russia have uh, estimated over 5,000 nuclear warheads in their respective arsenals. China, by contrast, historically has had 200 or so nuclear warheads and just 100 or so uh, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, a few long range bombers and six uh, nuclear submarines capable of carrying uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles. This is more comparable to what France and Britain possess than what the US and Russia have. China likewise has long insisted, uh, insisted that its small arsenal was intended exclusively for deterrence, to deter a first strike attack by the US or Russia and would never be used in a first strike attack on, on the others. However, in 2021, researchers at the Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Middlebury College, and then Hans Christensen and his colleagues at the Federation of American Scientists reported the discovery of approximately 300 ICBM missile silos under construction in Northwestern China, suggesting a huge buildup of nuclear forces. Uh, and Although these uh, missile silos have yet to be filled, so far as I know, we'll, we'll hear more from Hans about that, their discovery has set off a firestorm of speculation about China's nuclear expansion. Some US officials, including the commander of the US Strategic Command, have claimed that the silos of, are evidence of a massive Chinese nuclear buildup aimed at matching the US and nuclear, matching US and, and Russian nuclear capabilities and giving China the option of launching a nuclear first strike. These claims were given additional fuel through the publication in late November of, of, of this past year of the 2022 edition of the Pentagon's annual report on military and security developments involving the People's Republic of China, the PRC. That report made some extraordinary claims about China, including that the Chinese nuclear arsenal doubled over the past year from approximately 200 to 400 nuclear warheads, and that by extrapolating on that rapid buildup, we can expect that China will have a thousand or so warheads by 2030 and up to 1500 warheads by 2035. The Pentagon did indicate that China would have to overcome some significant hurdles to achieve those numbers, such as uh, establishing a new nuclear material supply line, but these qualifications were largely ignored by the mass media which led to headlines like this from ABC News on November 29th, quote, China to have 1500 nuclear warheads by 2035, the Pentagon, end quote. These headlines in turn have fueled calls on Capitol Hill 
for even more spending on US nuclear weapons and other measures to combat this hypothetical Chinese nuclear buildup. So our task today is to reach behind these claims and headlines and attempt to get some solid answers to three key, three key questions. First, what is the actual nature of the Chinese nuclear buildup and what does that tell us about Chinese nuclear policies? Second, to what degree has the Pentagon report on Chinese nuclear power exaggerated or misconstrued the reality of the Chinese nuclear buildup? And three, what are the implications of, of the actual Chinese uh, nuclear buildup such as it is? And B, the way these activities are being described in Washington and their political implications. So we have two great analysts to help us with that. And I will now turn it over, Avi, to explain the rest of the proceedings. Okay, thank you, Michael. So the first question that I'm going to ask the panelists to respond to is, to what degree is the Pentagon's report on China's nuclear weapons buildup accurate? And what do you think is actually happening? So the first um, person to respond to this will be Hans Christensen. Great, uh, let me just uh, share my screen here and so I can get right into it. Um, can you all see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and there's nothing in the way of it. it looks clear, okay. Um, thanks very much and thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to talk to you tonight um, or to, this morning, depending on where you are on the planet. Um, it is, um, of course, a dynamic and complicated issue um, that has a significant uh, potential and implications for not just sort of direct US-Chinese nuclear relations, but also sort of broader uh, security relations uh, in the region. Um, and much of that dynamic uh, is already in full swing. Um, what I've done here is just to put a few slides together that try to capture some of the main themes of what we see is going on, um, how the DOD talks about it, um, and what some of the uncertainties are that are important to keep in mind when you make um, estimates and projections about what might happen in the future. And so, um, uh, we have a second session where we're going to be talking a little more about you know, what to do about it. And so I'll leave a, a couple of slides for that as well. But let me start sort of off here with the evolution of the Chinese nuclear posture, because of course, like other nuclear weapon states, they have gone through their phases and they are in a um, dramatic phase right now. Um, and some things are changing and some things uh, are not. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that in the past uh, or up till now, you know, they've relied on what they call a minimum deterrent. They've never defined what a minimum is. No nuclear weapon state defines what a minimum deterrent is. Uh, whatever they have is always the minimum. <laughs> um, so, but that appears to be certainly numerically um, changing dramatically. Um, so to that extent, um, you know, the DOD report is based on, uh, you know, real developments. Uh, the question is how we interpret it and and what do you think it's going to lead to in the future. Um, it, we we have also seen China insisting over the years that it will not participate in a nuclear arsenal uh, or an arms race with other nuclear uh, weapon states. Um, and that may be true uh, still, but there's certainly a very significant dynamic going on uh, that is um, part of what is fueling uh, China's buildup right now. It is a perception, of course, about the threat to its forces, um, the way it sees it, um, and what to do about it. And uh, just like in other nuclear weapon states, they have their debates about that. It used to be a slow and, and, and steady nuclear modernization, uh, taking many, many years. Um, but but this round we're in now is a very uh, rapid uh, phase, it seems to uh, be. Uh, we see some very quick changes, just over two or three years. So um, I'll, I'll get into those. Uh, we saw we also see an expansion in the, in 
not only the number of warheads in the stockpile um, that that are needed to arm these uh, these launchers, but also um, uh, you know the diversity of the force. It appears to to some extent um, diversify to to more categories or um, categories that are more capable uh, or flexible. Um, then there are questions about what is going to do about it. You know, what does this mean? You know, is it a strategy to accomplish something particular in the military sense? What happens to China's um, uh, policies like no first use, uh, the fact that it has promised not to attack other nuclear weapon states with, with uh, nuclear uh, weapons and, and these types of things. A lot of issues, but I just want to put them up here in case it triggers some questions uh, that we can dive into later. Um, the most dramatic and what you hear most about right now, of course, is the, uh, the silo and the ICBM uh, modernization. And it is by Chinese standard dramatic. There's no doubt about it. We can see this uh, development going on um, on satellite photos, commercial satellite photos. I have assembled some of them here to give you an impression of what this is. What you see on the map there is a sort of a, a layout of where Chinese missile silos are. They also have mobile launchers, of course, but that's another issue. No need to get into that right here now. I'll focus on the silos. Um, you have the three large missile silo fields up in the northern part, uh, the Hami, Yumin, and Yulin uh, site that has been now rebaptized, rebaptized, and the training field up there where they're practicing. Then you have a number of brigades down in the south that are this, uh, you know, brigades that have been used for you know 30, 40 years for um, you know, the old DF-5 ICBMs. In, in three of those areas, well, in two of those areas, plus a third, we are seeing new construction of um, silos that appear for them as well. So there's both a dramatic uh, de development in the new silo fields up north, but also uh, important developments in, in the Southeast. And what we're seeing in those areas, this is an example from the Julin site, um, you can see the, the size of the area down below. There's about 90 silos just in this one field. And early on, they had this little bubble over each of the silo construction sites. You can see it up in the top picture to the right. And on this particular picture, we snapshot, uh, we were lucky enough to, to, to see a truck coming in. And you can see on the back of this truck is a large kind of greenish structure. That is the lid to the silo that will later be attached to um, the opening. You know, we can see it also in Russian silos, uh, et cetera. Um, that's the, 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 the sign they've chosen, but it's quite unique. It can just happen to be there at the moment that the satellite, uh, you know, caught that particular truck. And when they take off the bubble, it looks like what you see underneath. Um, it's a fenced in area. There's an access road. There's a silo that you can sort of barely make out. And then there's some surface structures, but it's supposed to be sort of a, um, an, you know, a, a, a bare facility that is controlled by distant uh, launch control centers. Um, down in the south, like I mentioned, we also see new development or construction. They are a little later. Um, we see these uh, in the valley constructions under these, uh, these buildings where they dig out the silos. And what I've highlighted here is a new uh, brigade that is being built with the 12 silos and a training silo. Um, this is twice as big as the normal DF-5 um, uh, silo brigades have been in the past. So this also indicates sort of a transition to a new structure for those uh, that, that portion of the ICBM force. Um, we also see a dramatic uh, development in the, in the naval forces with the ballistic submarine force. Here's a picture from the, the, the submarine base down in Highland Island uh, in the South China Sea area, where they're adding two new piers to be able to accommodate the extra ballistic missile submarines and tax submarines that are, that are being based in, the, in that facility. Um, and this is still a development that is ongoing. Um, they have expanded their uh, shipyards. Um, and, and so this is, this is another area of the Chinese military force that is in development. The third one, of course, is the bomber force, which traditionally has not had a active nuclear role, um, but they're now being assigned a nuclear role. And you can see some pictures here from uh, the, what is thought to be the first base that is integrating uh, a nuclear mission into you know, to its wing. 
Um, we can get into the details about this, what it is later, but this is just a snapshot of the runway with this taxiway over to the back of the mountain and these enormous tunnels where the, the planes can go in to, um, to reduce their vulnerability to attack. So implications for the Chinese arsenal. Obviously, the headlines are that this is the largest and the fastest expansion of the Chinese we've ever seen. I mean, I, I've been working on this for many years. I, I, I cannot remember anything that looks even remotely like it. Um, but it all depends on where they're going to go with this. Um, of course, um, if each silo that they're building um, then it is being loaded with a missile and 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 several warheads. It could easily double, uh, certainly triple, even quadruple the Chinese arsenal. If their assumptions, I'll get back to them in a, in a in a minute. Um, but as you can see, they're also de uh, developing the, the the ballistic missile submarine force and the bomber force being ab added to it. And and so the, all these elements that are that are being added to the Chinese capability they add up. And I think that's what we're seeing in the Department of Defense estimates that are coming out. Um, until we disclose these visual proof of these uh, developments in the public, they couldn't talk about it in the public. So they would make these claims that people doubted. I doubted it. It wasn't until we saw these developments that that we, we acknowledged that there was a dramatic uh, development. Just in comparison, look down to the left, we are observing something like 350 silos under construction right now. In the past, they've had about 20. Um, this is an enormous development. Um, the US entire missile um, force is 400 deployed silos, uh, 400 deployed missiles in silos. Um, Russia's silo um, inventory is 130 that are loaded. Um, so this is significant uh, force development here. Now, projections about where this is going to end have changed a lot over the years and varied. So here I've plotted a few of those kind of uh, projections we've heard in the past. The reason I say this, of course, is that defense agencies have in the past and the intelligence communities made projections that just didn't come through. Or they came through at a much lower level much later. And there is sort of a gen tendency for uh, defense intelligence agencies to, to project too much too soon. Like it's always worst case scenario, of course. Their job is find uh, enemies and, and tell the government what to do about it. And so here you can see in the 80s, we had dramatic projection from the, um, the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. They turned out not to pan out at all. Um, we saw an early indication of a growth there in the 2000 to 2010 period that was projected. It, did not turn out to be that significant, and it, it happened later. Um, and now we see the third round of projections, these very dramatic uh, projections that plot an arsenal of warheads that go all the way up to 1,500 in, in 35. There are a number of uncertainties that are very important about how do you get to those numbers. And so here is a simplistic way of illustrating it. This is just about different assumptions you can apply to the missile field and the effect that will have on what projection you will end up. So if you make the worst possible assumption that all of the silos will be filled, filled with missiles and that each missile will have three warheads, then you can get to 1500 with the force, okay? But if you assume that only half of the silos are filled um, and even they have uh, three warheads on them, that that would be sort of a shell game, you know, where they would keep some of these silos empty, and but the Americans or the Russians or the Indians, whoever were wanted to target, couldn't know for sure where the missiles were. Um, then you get to a much uh, smaller force, and down at the bottom, suppose only half of the silos are loaded, and each of the missile only has one warhead. Well, then the entire Chinese uh, nuclear stockpile or inventory needed to fuel, uh, needed to arm that force. Um, is only around 700 and, you know, 60 or so. Um, even that, of course, is a significant increase from the approximately 400 we think there today. But this just illustrates, I hope, that, you know, you, when you make assumptions, you can get to very big numbers very fast. But we really do not know, at least in the public, 
how the Chinese are going to arm these silos, how many of them and what, how many warheads on, on each missile. Um, even if they go to that highest projection that we have heard in the Department of Defense, here I have plotted it in the third column. So you can see this, the Chinese projection put on top of what we said China had last year. Um, and you compare that to uh, Russia and the United States. Even though if they do this, it's an enormous difference between the inventories that, uh, of Russia and, and the United States and will continue to be so. Um, other countries will most likely also begin to increase their arsenals. The Brits have said that they will not, they will increase a little, they will um, not reduce as much as they had planned. We don't know what the French will do so far, nothing. India, Pakistan are continuing, of course, to, to build up their forces, but at a lot, a much uh, lower level, you know, Israel is somewhat steady and North Korea is, is, is increasing as well. Um, so that's the sort of out year projection <clears throat> and the implications that we hear raised by um, US military commentators and, 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 and the Department of Defense in general. In the last report is that China is, is moving from what they called um, a, sort of a launch on, um, it, it's moving to a launch on warning posture. Um, that means that they will have sensors that can detect when an attack is coming. And they have a command and control system that's got to be good enough and missiles you can start fast enough that you can get these silos, uh, uh, these missiles out of their silos before the attack destroys them. This is a typical way of thinking that the, the Americans and the, that the Russians developed uh, during the Cold War. These are very entrenched um, strategies for those two countries. So the assumption here when people see these things is that the Chinese are going to try to copy that. Um, we know they're putting more uh, early warning satellites uh, in space, and we've seen a number of exercises that they've been doing already to try to incorporate this kind of posture into, into, their, into their strategy. Importantly, also, we hear the claim that putting a lot of solid fuel fast launching missiles into silos with an early warning uh, and launch on warning uh, system to support it, that means it questions China's no first use policy. It's a, it's a key claim we hear again and again and again. Um, I question that claim because I think, you know, it, you could easily imagine uh, China doing all of those things and still retain a no first policy, no first use policy. I mean, China, China could use nuclear weapons today first if it wanted to. It's been able to use nuclear weapons first even had, before it had a launch on warning. So that's not the issue here, I think. The issue is more, how is this modern, modernization going to influence Chinese thinking about what the role of its nuclear weapons is? Um, and when does it need to do what with them? That is still an unknown chapter uh, that has to be written. Um, but as you can see, there are a lot of assumptions being made already and claims about it. What is happening already, though, is that assumptions about this are already fueling the dynamic in the debate about not only uh, modernization of US nuclear forces, but also being used to question the value of arms control, specifically the New START Treaty. We hear explicit su suggestions that the United States cannot deter both Russia and, and China with the forces it is allowed to have deployed under the New START Treaty. Um, so people are proposing, some people are proposing that either the United States should um, negotiate with Russia to have more weapons deployed, or it should break out of the treaty and just do it. Um, it's a ridiculous uh, idea. Uh, we can get you know, into the dynamics of that, but of course, the stupidity of that kind of thinking is, you know, if the United States and Russia increase the, the level they can deploy, well, guess what the Chinese most likely are going to do? Or if the United States increases unilaterally its number of weapons, well, guess the, what the, 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 the Russians and the Chinese are going to do? So it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't lead anywhere. So let me stop with this. We can get back to uh, the other questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. So now we will hear from Tang Zhao. 
um, the same question. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Hans has given a really rich and comprehensive uh, review of China's uh, recent nuclear capability and its potential uh, future development. Um, there is, um, you know, there are, as, as Hans mentioned, there are some important uncertainties. And one of them is whether China has enough fissile material uh, to actually build the actual nuclear weapons uh, projected by the US government. Um, and here, of course, um, you know, people have pointed to uh, some recent evidence of a growing Chinese interest in its civilian uh, nuclear facilities, especially uh, its fast breeder reactors under construction and also its civilian uh, reprocessing uh, facilities uh, to produce uh, plutonium um, for uh, use in uh, future nuclear warheads. Um, and indeed, since 2017, uh, China has stopped uh, reporting its uh, civilian plutonium uh, stockpile uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, IAEA. And uh, so there is reduced uh, transparency. Um, and people have been debating, you know, uh, whether it is really uh, uh, technologically feasible uh, for China to use civilian facilities uh, to produce uh, nuclear weapon materials. Uh, and there are some legitimate questions. Um, and, uh, you know, some experts also uh, pointed out that even if China is going to use these facil for, uh, civilian facilities for producing uh, weapon materials, uh, it will still take some time uh, before China can complete its current uh, facilities and start uh, using them uh, for producing uh, weapon materials. And the amount of fissile materials that these civilian facilities might produce in the future appear relatively limited, at least in the you know, first uh, uh, years, first few years. So that uh, poses a question about how fast you know, China can produce uh, additional weapon materials. Um, so that uh, is widely regarded as a major uh, a potential uh, bottleneck on you know, how much China can really build up uh, its nuclear stockpile. But there are also, I think, uh, interesting uh, data points. For example, uh, you know, some experts already pointed out that uh, China used to uh, call uh, its uh, supposedly civilian uh, fast breeder reactors as uh, a civil military fusion project. Right. Um, uh, so that raises suspicion about whether indeed uh, those were intended for potential uh, military use. Um, so we need, you know, that's a major uncertainty going forward. Um, and there has been, you know, what is certain uh, at this point is uh, China's official narrative uh, 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 that uh, describes uh, the goal of uh, uh, China's uh, nuclear uh, capability has uh, significantly changed. Um, as, as Hans you know, uh, 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 implied uh, in his presentation many years ago, the Chinese official narrative is China was you know, uh, developing a lean and effective uh, nuclear capability. That means, you know, Chinese interest in maintaining a relatively small nuclear arsenal. Uh, but that narrative was no longer uh, used in recent years. And the new uh, uh, government narrative became in 2021 that China would build um, uh, 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 would build a, a, a high level uh, strategic deterrent uh, capability, uh, which is another term basically to refer to uh, uh, strategic weapons, including uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so that high level 
uh, is a, a major difference from the lean and effective uh, 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 language uh, uh, used uh, used to be used. Uh, and in 2022, during the uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, Chinese uh, Party Congress, the language again changed. It became that China is going to develop a powerful or um, um, uh, I think powerful is a relatively accurate translation. China is going to develop a powerful uh, strategic deterrent uh, capability system. Uh, so again, I think that's, that seems to uh, further elevate the goal of China's future nuclear capability development. Um, I, one point I think I want to uh, mention uh, uh, in order for people to better understand the larger context uh, in which all this is happening. Um, I agree with uh, Hans that um, the current round of nuclear buildup is uh, likely uh, partly driven um, by um, a desire to increase the technical capability of Chinese nuclear forces to survive a preemptive disarming first strike, and then to have enough uh, nuclear warheads uh, to uh, uh, retaliate uh, against the, the enemy and to defeat the uh, missile defense uh, systems uh, and other uh, um, uh, capabilities that enemy uh, may have in the future that could neutralize China's uh, second strike capability. Uh, I think that's an important driver, uh, but I think uh, equally important is that um, this round of the nuclear buildup, which is as, you know, as Hans uh, explained, is, is a dramatic uh, departure from China's traditional thinking and a posture uh, regarding nuclear weapons. And it appears to me that uh, it is very much driven by a top-down uh, political level mandate. Um, because according to the current uh, thinking of Chinese top leadership, uh, uh, China seems to believe that uh, China is facing a dramatically uh, more dangerous uh, international environment uh, in which the US and the US-led Western countries are becoming much more hostile against China. And they point to cases of uh, American uh, criticism on China on issues of human rights, Uyghurs, uh, in Xinjiang and Chinese repressive policy in Hong Kong, and you know the overall uh, more repressive domestic policy under the current paramount leader, Mr. Xi. Um, and China regards these Western criticism not as um, a genuine concern about uh, China's human rights or political freedom, um, but as an excuse used by Western countries in order to create troubles for China, uh, to make it harder for China to um, uh, make friends um, and to increase its international uh, influence um, and make it harder for China to concentrate on its economic and social developments. Uh, because this, this thinking goes that uh, it, the reason the US-led Western countries has been stepping up uh, their so-called hostile policy against China in recent years is because China has been too successful in developing itself. And China has been able to narrow the power gap uh, with the US-led Western countries. And so the US uh, and its Western partners are becoming more desperate to use all means possible to slow down China's growth, so, you know, to contain China, you know, so-called contain China. And uh, uh, the only way uh, to solve this problem uh, is uh, for China to build up its comprehensive uh, national power, and in particular, its uh, strategic capabilities. Uh, because if Western countries see you know, China has a much stronger strategic capability, they would be forced to accept China's rise and stop trying to contain China and 
uh, you know, uh, preventing China from uh, rising. So I think that's the larger political logic behind the current uh, nuclear buildup. Um, and you know, uh, I probably won't be able to uh, go to details, but let me end with a very quick uh, observation. Uh, despite the very fast growth of the arsenal at this moment, uh, there is uh, no uh, or very little evidence that China is already uh, China has already decided to achieve a nuclear parity with the United States or Russia. Um, the top Chinese political leaders and military leaders still use language like uh, uh, asymmetric strategic deterrent to describe their uh, military objective, which seems to me means that uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons, uh, China doesn't think it is necessary to have a similarly large nuclear arsenal as the United States and uh, or Russia. Um, what is more likely that China is uh, uh, doing is to uh, is taking a step by step approach to uh, build up its nuclear arsenal. Uh, it will build up uh, to some degree and then reevaluate its security environment and make a decision for the next step. Um, so I think that's that's the Chinese current thinking. That doesn't mean that uh, we wouldn't have a nuclear arms race uh, between US and China, because what I am worried is despite the self-perceived defensive objective uh, behind Chinese nuclear build, build up, despite the step-by-step -step, uh, approach of uh, nuclear decision making, by the time that China has acquired a larger nuclear arsenal, uh, I don't think uh, China-US security relationship would improve as the Chinese top leadership appears to expect. Rather, you know, uh, I, I think the nuclear buildup would only make US and its allies more concerned about China's strategic intent, uh, rather than make them more likely to accept China's rise and to show so-called respect to China. So if the security environment actually gets worse, um, I don't think uh, the Chinese leadership is going to uh, you know, um, reflect on its previous decision and acknowledge they made a mistake. Rather, they are likely to, to conclude that they perhaps haven't uh, built enough nuclear weapons. And with more, they would eventually force the US and Western allies to accept China's rise and to show China with respect. So I still think there is a real risk of um, a, a, a nuclear uh, arms race between the two sides, but it also means we, the US, for example, still has opportunity to influence China's decision making in the next few years. Thank you, Tom. So I'm going to turn it back to Michael to um, give us your thoughts. Well, I'll, I'll just add a few thoughts. I, I must say I'm I'm still absorbing what Tom just said, which is pretty, pretty worrying. And also what Hans told us, which is also extremely useful in understanding what's going on. Uh, let me just, if I could add anything, it's that we have to see all this in context with what the other nuclear powers are doing. Uh, we tend to hear about China's buildup as if it's happening in a vacuum, that the US and Russia are standing still and we see China out there uh, engaged in this uh, rapid or dynamic buildup that Hans described. And I, I think that would be a, a huge mistake. In fact, Russia and the United States have both been engaged in a, a long-term modernization and expansion or or elaboration enhancement of their nuclear forces for the past few decades. Russia has been engaged in that process for a number of decades. And, and by the way, I, I rely to a great extent on the excellent research that Hans and his colleagues at the Federation of American Scientists do. And I, I recommend their work to everyone. Uh, and it, it shows that uh, Ru Russia has been systematically replacing its older ICBMs um, and its bomber fleet and its nuclear submarine fleet 
the ballistic missile carrying submarine fleet with newer models uh, over the past two decades. And that process is, is reach, beginning to reach its culmination with, with uh, the process largely completed. Uh, the United States undertook a, a modernization of this sort beginning in 2010 when uh, President Obama brought the New START Treaty to the Senate for ratification. And as part of the negotiations with the Senate, uh, which did pass the, did, did ratify the treaty, uh, but, but there was a deal made that the US would commence a similar modernization of its forces with plans to replace all three legs of the nuclear triad. Nuclear triad being ICBMs, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles or SLBMs and nuclear bombers, that all three of those legs would be replaced with new systems. And that process got underway in the Obama administration and it was accelerated under the Trump administration and now it's, it's in full force. So, the Minuteman ICBM is being replaced with the more modern and capable Sentinel ICBM. It's now under construction. The Ohio class SSBN is being replaced by the Columbia class um, submarine and those are under construction. And the B-2 bomber and the B-52 bomber is being replaced by the B-21 radar uh, radar. Uh, bomber, uh, stealth bomber, and, and that's uh, now under construction as well. So there's been a, a modernization effort underway uh, in both countries since at least 2010. And in the case of the United States, that's also included a, a rather elaborate, uh, costly investment in ballistic missile defenses, BMD, ballistic missile defense. Um, that, that includes the ground-based uh, interceptor, mid-course interceptor, which uh, is intended to shoot down incoming enemy ICBMs. And um, it, also the uh, naval-based interceptor, the Aegis ballistic missile interceptor, and uh, at a regional basis, THAAD, the, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, which is deployed in South Korea. These um, ballistic missile interceptor programs are considered not to, to be not particularly effective, despite the billions of dollars that have been spent on them. Uh, but the U.S. is continuing to invest vast amounts of money in them, um, and the assumption is over time they will improve. Now. All of this has been known to Chinese officials for over a decade, and we can uh, we can be uh, safe in assuming that they've been watching them very carefully and plotting out how uh, they would affect Chinese security well into the future. And no doubt, Chinese officials uh, have have uh, studied these in closed meetings. We we don't know what goes on in those meetings. But uh, if I were sitting in those meetings, uh, we, we would be asking the question, we, we, could, we could assume they'll be asking the question, can we trust the safety of our very small deterrent force um, in the face of a possible first strike attack by either Russia or the United States? And, and can we assume that if any of our missiles survive, a first strike attack, will they be able to penetrate U.S. defenses and deliver a, a strike on U.S. territory, gar guaranteeing a, a second strike retaliatory capability? And I think we could be safe in assuming that Chinese officials concluded that the answer to those questions is no. Uh, the, the minimum deterrent capability that they had at the time would not be capable of of, of either of those, of surviving a first strike attack or, de or delivering um, a, a second strike retaliatory force. 
and uh, and I think they they decided concluded that to ensure that they could deter an attack by the U.S. or Russia, they would have to substantially beef up their uh, second strike retaliatory capabilities. And how would you go about that? Um, uh, what, what would be the ways to do that? It, you could multiply your forces, uh, which they are doing, and uh, you could also make it harder for the other side to attack. So uh, my reading of the multiple silos, or one possible reading of the multiple silos that Hans described so well and showed us pictures of, was to, is to frustrate an enemy first strike. If you have 300 silos uh, and, an, and, and an enemy doesn't, isn't sure which ones are loaded with missiles, you need 300 missiles to destroy them with assurance. And you probably need two or three to ensure that, that you knock out all of them. So that would require half of the US ICBM fleet alone. Uh, uh, will China fill all of those silos with missiles? We don't know the answer to that, as, as Hans made very made clear. We, we just don't know. But an equally plausible explanation is, is not so much to increase China's strike power, but to frustrate an enemy first strike. The other, what you could also do, uh, to, to increase your, uh, the, the utility of your second strike is to put multiple warheads on your missiles, which China is also doing, which probably explains, here I'm citing Hans and his colleagues, it, it probably explains the increase in warhead production that we've seen over the past few years. So uh, to conclude, uh, just to raise some questions, which, which I hope we'll get around to. Uh, I, I, I grasp from uh, what Hans and Tong have said, there, there are different reasons why uh, this buildup is underway, but a perfectly plausible explanation is a response to what Russia and China are doing. So I'll, I'll finish there. Wonderful, thank you so much. So now I will pose the second question, um, which is what should the US response to these developments be? And I will turn it over to Hans to begin. And um, Hans, were you going to um, put your PowerPoint up again? You're muted. Um, Hans, you're still muted. Can you please unmute? Hans. Sorry, yes. Um, okay, you are unmuted. So once I you just- go to full screen, you can't see your, so anyway, thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, ask you to clarify something in your earlier presentation, because yeah. somebody posted this in the question, um, in the bar graph, if you could explain the terminology that you were using in the bar graph. Um, reserve, non-reserve, strategic. Okay. Yes. I'll quick, okay. I'll before you that. before you jump into what yes. you're. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, if if we just look at the U.S. and Russia, so on the left, the the, the red bar at the bottom, those are the ones that are oper Those are the warheads that are operationally deployed. They're either on ballistic missiles on land or on the submarines, or they are at bomber bases in storage at bomber bases, but bomber bases where you have active bombers that can fly with them very quickly. The, the blue uh, category, they are reserve warheads. Uh, they are what um, in the United States are referred to as the hedge. You, you can upload them onto the existing force to increase your, your nuclear power. Uh, both the United States and Russia have that. That category has grown relatively to the deployed because partly of the New START Treaty, because in order to meet that limit on the New START Treaty, the two countries had to uh, you know, uh, adjust how many weapons, warheads they had on their, uh, their forces. Um, if you take those two categories together, 
the deployed and the reserve, that is what we United States called the stockpile. So when the Department of Defense goes out and says, we have 3,800 nuclear weapons in our stockpile, that's those two categories together. The gray zone on top of them, those are warheads that have been retired. They are no longer in the Department of Defense custody. They are in the Department of Defense queue for dismantlement, but they haven't dismantled them yet. So when talk, countries talk about the United States and Russia continue to reduce their overall inventory of nuclear weapons, that is because they're eating away on those two gray categories. That's where the reductions are happening. They're not happening in the operational force. Anyway, I hope that helped. And if you have further questions, let me know. Thank you. Um, so I will. I want to divide my 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 intro here to the what to do about it up in two sections. There's one that has to do with the dynamic, the military rivalry between the two sides. Um, this is where there there's a, there's real need to try to calm that rivalry down, and um, and the reason is that once you get into it, it's very hard to back out. It's very hard to shift gear because if you shift gear, you're seen as weak, either to your allies or to your domestic population or whatever the whatever the circumstances are. Um, this is where there's a real problem because I think our foreign policies are so militarized that it is hard to see, you know, State Department coming in and saying, well, guys, let's calm this one down a little because I think really, um, you know, it's not going to produce anything except a strong military counter reaction to it. Um, the foreign policy drive is very dominated by, <clears throat> by deterrence thinking. Um, so that's one particular, um, I think, uh, important um, a challenge for us. Um, how do we do that? Um, when China has chosen to increase its force, it may have its national reasons to do it for, you know, justifiable national interests or, you know, whatever one uh, chooses to call it. But seen from the United States, certainly from the United States military, by increasing its force, and especially by increasing its ICBM force, China is seen as playing into the deterrence game more directly with the United States on US deterrence terms. And so you, you begin to sort of get into this kind of thinking that, aha, they're building this structure. Well, that means they're going to do this. Um, and so that dynamic sort of further fuels um, the response that we're seeing over here. It very much hardens the deterrence posture and the deterrence thinking. Um, but I want people also to think that in the public debate, when we talk about deterrence or the how many nuclear weapons do you need for what? It's, we, we, we just hear these terms, oh, you need to be able to deter an adversary. But, what that means is so complicated. You know, it's not just to have a force that can do that. It's how you apply it. It's what you do with it. And it's how the other side understands what you're trying to say. And so most people will say, well, you probably don't need more than a couple of hundred nuclear weapons to scare an adversary from doing something stupid. Uh, and most countries in the world, I think most nuclear weapon states in the world, they agree with that, I think. That's not how the military planners in the nuclear mission, they think. Yes, deterrence up front is, of course, the starting point. You want to deter an adversary from starting to use nuclear weapons or doing other things, depending on what it is. But most of the requirement for these forces comes from what happens after deterrence fails. That is when the military needs to go and do the things they have to do, knock out the forces, to achieve certain objectives that have been identified and articulated in the guidance that comes from the presidents, <clears throat> the president and the and 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 the, uh, the 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 Department of Defense, and that is a much larger uh, force, and it's a much um, more demanding uh, requirement, technical requirement. So. I'm mentioning these things to, to hopefully stimulate some questions about that dynamic and, and what to do about it, how to 
uh, reduce that the military dynamic. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't think it's enough to suggest we should just not do these things because those kind of arguments tend not to change any you know votes or or or, or opinions uh, sort of uh, in 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 the more hardcore uh, camp. I think it's more valuable to try to articulate with, if there are certain uh, if, if some of these acts uh, trigger negative developments, things that are really counterproductive. Um, that's more where you can sort of you can let you can get an ear of, of, of people that are in the decision making process. The other aspect of this, of course, has more to do with sort of arms control. Um, that we normally talk about when we're talking about reducing dangers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a number of potential uh, areas where you could imagine you could approach the Chinese and try to get an, a, a, you know, an interaction going. I just want to remind people before I go into it, this is not a new debate. We have been in conversations with the Chinese for many decades about nuclear weapons strategy, the role of nuclear weapons, what does their policy mean? There is a great team, um, uh, out in Hawaii, for example, uh, that has run these track 1.5, as they call them, meetings over the years where you have some government officials and some non-government officials together. They meet with each other to develop a relationship. They understand each other's language. You dive into the rationale and the understanding of what it is that the other country's uh, doing and why they're saying what they're doing. Meetings like that, interactions like that, whether they are um, at that level or military to military, are hugely important of, and beneficial to um, improve understanding and discussions <clears throat> about what's going on. I have listed a number of types of actions you could take. And starting with the numerical limits, this is how we normally talk about it when we talk US, Russia, arms control, New START treaty, these types of things. We don't have that with China. And so the Trump administration tried to push through that China should be involved, but of course, you know, they didn't want to be involved uh, at this stage. Uh, so they're not interested in, in, in doing that right now. The US very much is interested, but has failed so far to engage the Chinese on it. Uh, but of course, it has to stay engaged with the Russians. Um, you could also talk about sort of operational limits or, or limits on the types of weapons you have, not on the numbers, but more sort of on the, the, the way your posture looks, what can it do? Um, it's possible that the two sides can, um, will start discussions on that type because it, it, it can't be an sort of a, it can't be from the same uh, premise. Each country has its own individual interests. And whatever they whatever they agree to, or the, the the way they approach these conversations, have to take that into consideration. So you can't just say, "Well, we don't have that category of weapon, therefore you can't have it either." You know, you have to have a conversation that is about the individual characteristics of the countries that are that are involved. There has to be something in it for them too. Um, much more possible, I think, are sort of softer forms of. Um, interaction or engagement that has to do with sort of crisis management, um, preventing dangerous incidents, those types of things, rules of the road, where you 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 make agreements about there are certain things you just shouldn't do uh, or try to avoid because they trigger other things that are more dangerous. So here I think there is a possibility uh, to get um, into deeper conversations. We've had strategy discussions about, you know, exactly what is your nuclear strategy? Why, what do you, what do you mean when you say you have, you know, counterattack capabilities or what does nuclear non-first use mean? And try to understand or improve the understanding. Those kind of discussions have happened in the past. They can go on, um, but they're vulnerable, vulnerable to the political climate uh, that exists at any given time because they're easy to stop, so to speak. Then this is the last one. There's this sort of a generic thing about <laughs> reducing secrecy or rather uh, increasing transparency. This is a popular Western argument for, you know, what needs to be done. You know, we hear this again and again from the Pentagon that the Chinese are very secretive and they don't want to share what they have. And this is increases uncertainty and whatever. And that is true to some extent, of course, but 
you know, we do have a fair amount of insight in, in, in terms of what the Chinese are doing, despite of efforts to keep it secret. So at this macro level of nuclear force developments, I think it's less of an issue. Um, it's, it's more the opposite increasing transparency can you, be used to, um, to help improve relation, to help improve the climate as a goodwill gesture. Like for example, we don't need that the Chinese have to say, this is exactly how many warheads we have. But if they could say things, things like, how many ICBMs do you plan to have in 10 years? Something like that, that, that gives a better understanding. But I'll leave it with this. Um, so hopefully it has triggered some uh, questions. Yes, there are a lot of questions. Um, all right, I will turn this over to Tong. Well, thank you. Um, I think uh, we, uh, my most important uh, uh, thought, uh, I, I think, is uh, we shouldn't uh, give up too easily on finding a political solution to the underlying political problems uh, between US and China, which is fundamentally driving this Chinese nuclear buildup. Um, you know the the way the, the the real problem is we do not you know the the, the nuclear buildup is just the uh, symptom of the underlying disease, and at the bottom of all the uh, issues we actually have a political problem, um, and that causes you know the the nuclear and and you know conventional uh, arms race etc., and the political problem has not been adequately understood here and in many other parts of the world. Uh, the principal problem, first and foremost, is the uh, increasing information gap and perception gap between, for example, US and China. And this gap exists at the societal level. Right? Um, today, you know, the, you know, we don't have basic uh, shared understandings on, you know, a simple facts. Uh, uh, you know, for, for example, you know, uh, uh, China genuinely believes that the U.S. provoked the Ukraine war uh, in order to weaken Russia and advance American geopolitical interests. And you know, on the issue of Taiwan, which is the most dangerous flashpoint in the Asia Pacific region. China genuinely believes, right? There is this very popular thinking in China that it's the US that is deliberately provoking a Chinese attack on Taiwan in order to repeat its similar tactic to use a war to gradually weaken China and to prevent China's successful rise, right? All kinds of conspiracy theories are wild. Um, so I think that part of the story, which is really important, has now been fully understood here. And when you live in that environment, that information environment, where people are all driven by crazy theories about American intent, and it's not, not that surprising that you know, decision makers believe that with, you know, they need a larger nuclear arsenal in order to calm down the United States. They really think the U.S. is becoming crazy and becoming more desperate to go after China and, and is willing to use more extreme means to slow down China's growth. Um, so that's the bigger underlying political problem. You know, that is the same underlying political challenge that led to and prolongs the Ukraine war, right? If you look at Ukraine war, the Russian people, even today, they are still largely supportive or at least acceptive of this war. Uh, and that's a major e enabling factor of the war. And here in the Asia Pacific region, I'm really concerned that very similar, if not worse, information perception gap between the two sides has a real potential to lead to a conflict and is already driving this nuclear competition dynamic, if not a comprehensive military uh, arms race. Um, so we, don't, we, we, we cannot give up on trying to find a, a political solution 
Um, and here I, I agree with Hans. I think the U.S. policy community is too, uh, you know, uh, 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 preoccupied at the military uh, level of the problem. Uh, they, you know, some of them seem to understand the underlying political issue, but they don't seem to think there's anything to be done, can be done. So the only solution is basically to strengthen American deterrence so that, you know, that can prevent war. Um, and if we only look at the military level, then U.S. efforts to strengthen, you know, nuclear capabilities is very likely to feel the already very strong Chinese paranoia about U.S. intent. And it's only going to make Chinese leaders easier to make a decision about a, a larger nuclear arsenal down the road. Uh, and you know, some of the U.S. military uh, assumptions really need to be better uh, questioned and analyzed, right? The question about you know, the necessity to deter two nuclear peers at the same time, I think that assumes very close nuclear uh, planning coordination between Russia and China so that the two countries would simultaneously pose a nuclear threat or even try to fight new, uh, US uh, at the nuclear level in, in, in a conflict. Uh, I don't think there is strong enough trust between China and Russia to make that type of uh, close nu joint nuclear uh, coordinating, uh, nuclear uh, planning coordination possible. Um, so uh, I think that's where uh, uh, US policy community can better think through their uh, response uh, policy. And last point I want to make is, it's really hard to engage China right now because of the, you know, the, the, you know, the political uh, uh, perception gap. We are not living in the same uh, universes when, when it comes to fact, basic facts. Um, so it really requires US and other parts of the international community to try to engage with China as you know, uh, proactively as possible. And that's, you know, I think, uh, justifies sometimes an effort to uh, you know, be willing to uh, talk about topics that China wants to talk. I think that's the only way you can uh, get China on board to discuss these issues. And China wants to discuss no first use. Um, you know, I think there are ways the US can use those topics and turn them into a very uh, uh, useful and constructive two-way conversation and help China also understand, you know, there are issues with its own nuclear thinking. Um, so, you know, do not be afraid to talk about issues that China wants to talk. Maybe, you know, the easiest way uh, to start some uh, substantive uh, conversations. Thank you. And finally, Michael. Oh, well, uh, it's a it's a little intimidating to follow all of this and 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 provide some some thoughtful uh, ideas about about how to proceed. Um, listening to all of this and preparing for it, I I can't help but think of my my childhood. I I grew up uh, during the Cold War, and I very well remember the the missile the Soviet missile gap and other reports about uh, Soviet military superiority in nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles as a driving force behind the US military buildup in the 1950s and 1960s. A, a lot of those claims were later proven to be completely inaccurate. Uh, Soviet weaponry and technology was proven to be far inferior to that of the US at the time. And the numbers were, were all made up uh, by politicians uh, for for political advantage at the time, as it turned out. Uh, so I, I'm uh, very aware of that history. And what strikes me about this conversation is the absolute need for unbiased information and the need to make that as widely disseminated as possible, which is why I'm so grateful for Hans and for Tang for their contribution tonight and the work that they do and to try to make uh, sensible, um, unbiased information available to the public. Uh, and I think all of us have a very hard task ahead of us 
to uh, further that work in our communities, um, in conversations with our representatives in Washington, um, wherever we can to uh, try, try to uh, combat the disinformation that's being spread. Now, I, I, I distinguish disinformation from, uh, uh, I'm not from uh, accurate reporting, as we've heard tonight on the reality of what's going on, which is a very dangerous uh, situation where uh, all of the nuclear weapons powers are expanding or enhancing their nuclear capabilities simultaneously. And in my mind, uh, this is exceedingly dangerous, uh, not least because the weapons uh, that are being built today are, uh, are intended to be used in ways uh, that, uh, that um, privilege early use, uh, early use of these weapons. Mm -hmm. So uh, the arms race today, not only is it three countries, not two, uh, but there is a real um, uh, privileging of early use of those weapons. So it's a frightening time and uh, it's essential therefore that I, I think that we do, that we all try to combat all of the misinformation and exaggeration that we hear and try to have a realistic conversation about the dangers we all face jointly as a result of what's going on. So that, that's what I take from this. Um, we've tried uh, the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy, that, that is our objective, is to promote sane policies between the US and China to provide that kind of information. But it's, it's just a start. Um, and we hope that it, all of you who are listening uh, will do what you can to, um, to further this process of providing informed information to the public. Uh, this uh, presentation tonight will be, is, has, is being recorded and it will be available at our website, saneuschinapolicy.org, so that you, you'll be able to see it and to share it with others. And I hope you'll uh, make use of the information that we post on our website and contact us for other ways in which we can help make this kind of information available. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we have a lot of really interesting questions here and we have very little time left. So what I'm thinking I will do is summarize several of the questions and then just turn it over to the three speakers to spend a few minutes answering whatever you feel most moved to answer. Um, there was a set of questions that referred to um, U.S. domestic interests, and especially um, the profit motive in terms of the Pentagon and the weapons industry in inflating the um, Chinese threat in order to promote greater weapons production or you know, justify greater weapons production in the United States. Um, and a related question about whether perhaps China's buildup is designed for that very purpose to make sure that the United States will waste money building more weapons, which would help uh, contribute to strengthening China. Um, there were a couple of questions about the um, an, what was announced today in terms of the US military buildup in the Philippines. Um, and in terms of both questions, uh, both countries, is there a relationship between nuclear arms buildup and increase in conventional military forces? So that was the second set of questions. Um, there was a um, poignant question. Is there anyone in the US government thinking about negotiations? Is that even being entertained? Um, and there was a question um, aimed specifically at Tong. Uh, do you think it's possible that Chinese leaders believe that US political instability and the rise of reckless politicians like Trump make the possibility of a US first strike um, a, a genuine concern? Um, okay, I think I will stop there. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe each of you can just speak 
to a few of those questions that you would like to answer. Um, Hans, do you want to begin? Sure. Um, I think I'll start with number two, or the one I heard as number two, which was this relationship between conventional and nuclear. Um, because I think that's really interesting. Um, there are a number of things to keep an eye on. Um, one is sort of, um, you, for the United States, when the Cold War ended, the United States made a, um, a very strong effort um, to reduce the role of nuclear weapons, both in terms of numbers, but also the, 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 the missions they play. Uh, didn't go as far as, as many people had hoped, of course, but compared to how it was during the Cold War, the late 80s and, and early 90s even, uh, significant changes were, were made where conventional was were seen to gradually play a bigger role. Nuclear moved further in the background. It was still important and was very much there. Um, and, and unfortunately, of course, now what we're seeing is, is, is sort of things are beginning to uh, swing, at least in the rhetoric, um, the other way around. Um, but I still think it's important to remember that because of that development for over so long, we actually see a sort of somewhat of a military uh, hesitant reaction to getting too much into the nuclear response again. Sure, you hear it from, from the hawks, the uh, you know, hardliners, and, and the, who have always argued these cases. And, and yes, you hear it from the military services, those of them whose job it is to advocate for the nuclear forces. Um, but overall, it's still surprisingly um, it's kind of muted uh, compared to what it was, not just with China, but also with, with Russia, what Russia is doing uh, in, in Ukraine. The United States has not been willing to play into the nuclear saber rattling, and for very specific reasons. Now, it can do that because it has much better conventional forces and can <laughs> afford to wait longer. But I think it's an important nuance to keep, keep in mind that, that even when people sort of say, well, we have to do more on nuclear, well, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you have sufficient forces. It's more about how you signal them or how you talk about them. You don't need more stuff, you know. Um, so I think that's an important dynamic. And I think it's different in Russia because of the war in Ukraine, not only have we seen Russian conventional forces being not nearly as good as we thought they were, um, but they've also depleted their force level. So I think in the, the near term, that is actually going to deepen the Russian um, reliance and belief in the importance of nuclear weapons to protect themselves. You know, they're weaker conventionally and all that stuff. NATO is stronger conventional and will be more so in the in the future. So that's going to fuel that kind of thinking. Um, and so there, there's a loop there as well. So those are some some things to think about here. Um, frankly, I think that the the, the 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 importance of the Chinese military, yes, import, nuclear is important, but the importance of the Chinese military modernization is much more in the conventional forces, because those are the forces that can be used. Those are the forces that you can do things with. Um, and, and so so I think, in a way, that's another conversation, but that's an, a much more important in terms of where things can happen. Is the US government thinking about arms control with the Chinese? Are there people doing it? Absolutely. There are people thinking uh, what that can look like. What are those conversations? Not just with China, but also with Russia, even things are bad. There will come a day when it is possible or a door will open up and, and we need to be ready and have ideas know the people who will do it, how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important that that um, internal process continues to happen and resources are given to people in the institutions and outside to be able to step in whenever that is needed. So, but yes, it is happening. Thank you. And um, it is 8.29 and the official ending time tonight is 8.30, but I'm going to unilaterally decide to let this go on for about 10 minutes so that we can have final comments from all of our speakers. So I know some people probably need to leave, but um, but I will cut it off after 10 minutes. Those of you who are, are staying on, I don't think we'll be here all night. Um, Tong, would you like to respond to any of the questions? Uh, sure. Um, let me address the question about if China is deliberately uh, uh, designing a strategy 
to waste American money by you know, leaving those silos empty without actually deploying missiles and warheads um, so that China can actually save its resources and money and to better develop its economy and become the number, number one economy in the world. Uh, it, it makes sense in theory, but uh, I, I'm not sure that's the Chinese thinking. Um, I, I think uh, there, you know, Chinese military strategists are uh, very concerned about the very advanced American space-based surveillance uh, capabilities, um, and um, I, I think you know uh, one of the reasons they, you know. Uh, they didn't really focus on uh, uh, building their traditional road mobile uh, ICBMs. Uh, is perhaps partly because they they figured out uh, throughout the years of operating this road mobile nuclear missile system that it's it's really challenging uh, to uh, hide uh, from uh, uh, U.S. space based sensors the uh, locations and uh, uh, movements of those uh, missile vehicles. So it's actually not that easy to make them survivable. Um, and similarly, I think, uh, you know, if we read their writings, I don't think they have a high level of confidence that uh, the US can just be fooled uh, about which silo is actually deployed with real missiles, which silo is left empty. Because over time, those are fixed targets. The U.S. can concentrate sensor capabilities and monitor, you know, tiny activity uh, around those silos, you know, with with a lot of resources. And over time, you know, there will be, uh, you know, you have to make it look really real. You have to make serious efforts and you invest real resources to make, you know, to fake, uh, you know, the, the real operations needed. Uh, around a real silo. Uh, so I don't think China, you know, it makes sense to spend all those resources to just fake a silo and, and rather you, you should just you know, deploy a real uh, missile. Um, and for that reason, I'm also a little skeptical about the theory of, of shell game. I don't think it would endure long-term surveillance uh, and can, can you know, uh, maintain secrecy about what is really going on. Uh, under each uh, silo cover. Um, so I tend to uh, uh, think there is a real chance China is going to deploy real missiles in each and every uh, silo. Um, a second question is about, uh, is it possible that because of you know, a, a crazy uh, American politician like Trump, that China has become genuinely worried that those politicians might actually launch a comprehensive nuclear first strike on China one day out of no good reason. And that is perhaps what is driving the Chinese nuclear buildup. Um, um, my uh, response is, uh, of course, we don't know. Um, that's a theoretical possibility. Uh, but at the you know, technical level, nuclear, you know, China's calculation of how much nuclear is sufficient is always based on worst case calculation in which the US would launch a comprehensive first strike using nuclear and conventional precision weapons all together to destroy as many new Chinese nuclear weapons as possible. And then the US will use missile defense to intercept whatever survived a nuclear warheads. So it's all, all already based on worst case scenario calculation. Uh, so uh, US president being more willing to uh, think about that a, a crazy scenario shouldn't, uh, you know, a, a, a significantly change the Chinese calculation about how many warheads are sufficient. But more, more importantly, if you look at Chinese domestic discussion within the expert and policy community, they always talk about the so-called structural change in the international balance of power all, as the main reason why the US-led Western countries have become more hostile against China. They sometimes talk about, talk about you know, Trump, you know, crazy US politicians, but that's not in separation to this structural uh, interpretation of international relations. It's as part of this because they, they interpret the crazy uh, uh, 
rhetoric and behavior of President Trump as part of the U.S. becoming more desperate as a result of China closing the power gap with the United States. Um, so I still think uh, uh, it's not, you know, mostly driven by uh, Trump or other, uh, uh, you know, individual American politicians. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, well, first, Tang, thank you for uh, for um, altering my perception of the silos and their use in the shell game. I'll have to take that into consideration in the future. I still think there's some logic there, but you've convinced me that that may be wrong. So I'll have to think about that. Uh, but in answer to the uh, questions, um, there the reference to the link between conventional and nuclear forces is related to two of the questions. One of them is about spending, uh, US domestic spending. Uh, nuclear weapons spending is significant in the US, but it's really a small portion of what we call the military industrial complex gains. Most of the money goes to conventional weapons overwhelmingly. So uh, the way that I think all of this plays into that is that uh, the, the headlines about China's nuclear buildup fuels, feeds the fears about China is, is used to, to create a hysteria, uh, anxiety about China in Congress. And it's this overall uh, anxiety, which uh, Tang and Hans both uh, referred to, um, that then is used to justify spending across the board on weaponry. And so the, the arms manufacturers don't specifically point to nuclear weapons, but to, to the Chinese threat writ large. And that indeed is going gung-ho. And that's why I say it's essential that we examine that with clear eyes and try to combat misinformation and exaggeration about that. But there's another very important connection here and Tang referred to um, the use of precision guided weapons in a conflict with China. And, and here I see a very dangerous, um, or maybe Hans as well, I'm sorry. Uh, as Hans explained, uh, the, the US did, uh, beginning with the Obama administration, explicitly state that as we um, re reduce our dependence on nuclear weapons, we would place much greater emphasis on developing uh, high quality conventional weapons that could be used in a strategic way. And in the case of uh, Asia Pacific, this includes hypersonic missiles aimed at China's command and control facilities, its missile launch facilities, and, and so on, and, and other uh, precision guided weapons that are now being procured in large numbers. And these uh, pose a threat not only to China's conventional forces, but to its nuclear uh, attack capabilities, its, its um, ability to detect a possible nuclear attack and to respond swiftly. So it could create a, a situation uh, where China is a, attacked with conventional weapons, but is unsure whether the, it's a prelude to a conventional invasion or all out nuclear attack. And so may be um, prompted to, to respond in a nuclear fashion. Uh, so there, there is a way in which the conventional buildup could, could uh, prompt the early use of nuclear weapons. And this is a great danger and uh, why, and, and it's why talks, if we can get them underway between the US and China should focus especially on these um, strategic threats to nuclear stability. Uh, and, 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 and that's where I would put my emphasis. So I'll, I'll finish there. Okay, um, well, my, Ten, you guys kept to my 10 minutes very perfectly. So um, does anybody want to make any final comment before we close it up? Well, thank you for 
I mean, for, for uh, chairing this session so ably, thank you for that. Thank you, Hans and Tang, for participating. Absolutely. Thank Thanks to everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who attended, and thank you so much to the speakers for all of the information and analysis that you offered us here. A lot to think about. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very thank much. You. Good night. Good night.